Okay, in this pre-lecture video, we're going to be talking about a reaction of alkenes, the hydration reaction of alkenes. Um, obviously, our starting material is an alkene, and in this example, we're treating this acid with, with I'm sorry, this alkene with H3O plus and acid. So the first thing we really need to do here is just kind of talk about acids in general a little bit. H3O plus is a generic term for an acid. There's other ways we can write this. I could write dilute H2SO4, dilute H3PO4. Here's the actual structure of H3O+. Um, and then sometimes I actually just write this as an H plus in water. Um, it turns out that the H3O plus structure is the most accurate description of what is um, what this looks like. We don't have free H plus floating around when water is available. Um, when we treat this with strong acids like H2SO4, H2SO4 is in fact strong enough to protonate water to give you H3O+. But you'll see me writing down H+, many times um, when we're doing reactions with acids because it's easier to draw our mechanism. All right, so H3O+, is really our generic term for acid. So the first thing that I'm going to do here is just kind of add in my H plus and my water and just include a couple of lone pairs on here for us to help visualize this reaction Okay, so looking at this reaction, we've talked about it before. In a hydration reaction, the product that we're going to get out is we're going to add an H and an OH, so not H2O and OH, across the alkene. And the main product that we really get out here is we will break that carbon-carbon sp2 bond. And we're going to add two new bonds, a bond to an OH and a bond to an H. And again, we don't have to show those CH bonds, so I'm just going to draw in my OH bond. So in our hydration reaction, we start with an alkene here, and the functional group we get out at the end is an alcohol. Okay, we get out an alcohol at the end. So what we should do here is really go through the mechanism Alright, sorry, we lost our structure for a second. So we want to go through this mechanism. So let's do that. Um, my first step is the alkene is going to attack our H+. And if we remember, there's really two structures we can kind of get out of this. Right? I can form a new carbon-hydrogen bond on this carbon generating a carbocation on that side, or I can form a new carbon-hydrogen bond on this side, generating a carbocation on the other side. So let's draw, draw those two possibilities. All right, what I'm going to do is include our original hydrogens in black, so we can just make sure we are comfortable with the number of hydrogens we have. So our first option, let's draw in our hydrogens, is remember we break this carbon-carbon double bond and I form a new bond to H. So what I'm going to do is put the H on the sp2 carbon that is below. So we can draw that new bond here and that's to that H. The consequence if we add our bond here is this did have four bonds to it, now it only has three, therefore our carbon on the top has a positive charge. So that's one possible structure, okay, one structure we can have, right, or we can kind of do the opposite, where instead of adding the hydrogen to this carbon, we can add the hydrogen to the the carbon on the right side. So let's draw out the consequence of that, or the result of um, that part of this reaction. 
So again, we had two H's here, two H's. And what we're saying is this is our new bond. Here's our original hydrogen below. So we've now broken this sp2 pi bond, form a new bond to H. That H has added to the side that has more hydrogen, shown here. And then, of course, the consequence of that is um, this structure now has a carbocation on the opposite carbon. So these are really the two choices on what we can do. So to think about which structure actually happens, we really need to think about the stability of these two structures. Um, and when we do that, we really need to think about the stability of the carbocations and point out this is a secondary carbocation. Okay, so this carbon here is a secondary carbocation. And we're really comparing that to the other carbocation there, and it turns out that is a primary carbocation. So what we remember about carbocation stability is the, the more substituted the carbocation, the more stable it is, and that's because of hyperconjugation. So the structure on the right is, in fact, the structure that we do form. We do not form this intermediate we form a secondary carbocation because it is more stable. All right, so that's our first step of our reaction. We protonate the alkene. The next step we're going to do is now our alkene is a very good electrophile. It has a positive charge. So what species do we have that has a set of electrons? Well, here's our water. Our nuclear, and this is called the nucleophile, the lone pairs on the oxygen will act as a nucleophile and attack our plus, and that's our second step in this mechanism. So let's draw that out. This lone pair will come and attack that carbocation to form a new bond. So let's draw our equilibrium here and draw out the structure that we just created. There is um, my four carbon backbone. If you notice over here, this is an H, an H, an H. This is just a methyl. I'm just going to leave that. And what I'm doing is making a new bond from O to this carbon. So I'm going to create that new bond. Here it is in orange. And that is bound to oxygen. This oxygen, so we have a new bond. That lone pair forms a new bond to that carbon, as shown here. This O, now instead of having two lone pairs, has one lone pair, okay? And it is still connected to two hydrogens. So we've basically made a new bond from O to carbon, lost that lone pair. And a consequence of that is this oxygen now only has one, two, three, four, five valence electrons when it wants six. So therefore, this oxygen it does, in fact, have a positive charge around it. Okay. So that is the intermediate we form here. Well, our final structure doesn't have a positive charge, so we need to um, get rid of that somehow. And that is, in fact, our last step of this reaction, getting rid of that extra hydrogen. And how we do that is we're going to use another equivalent of water. This time, this equivalent of water is going to be used to get rid of that extra H, and that is called a deprotonation step. So let's draw that step out. I'm going to form a new bond from this new molecule of water to that hydrogen. That's regenerating H3O+. Plus. Okay. But as I'm doing that, at the same time, I'm going to break this oxygen-hydrogen bond. And these two electrons here are going to form a lone pair on the O, thereby eliminating my positive charge. So our last step is a deprotonation. A separate, sepa a separate molecule of water will take away this H, form a new bond there, regenerating H3O+. And as that happens, 
the hydrogen-oxygen bond is broke, and that becomes an additional lane, lone pair on this O. So let's just draw in those two lone pairs. We didn't have them originally. So the oxygen now has two lone pairs and six valence electrons and is neutral. Okay, so overall, going through our mechanism, our first step is to protonate. We generate the more stable carbocation by putting the H on the side that has more H's. That's Mark Karnikoff's rule. Our OH will act as a nucleophile, attack our electrophile, all right, this secondary carbocation, forming a new oxygen-carbon bond. And again, we still have the O connected to the two H's, and therefore this oxygen has a plus charge. So another equivalent of water will come in, deprotonate the H on this protonated alcohol. These two electrons will reform a lone pair. I go from bond to lone pair, generating my neutral species, my alcohol, to give me my final product. Okay, so our final product here is an alcohol. Okay, so let's look at a, another problem here, kind of our, our next problem. A uh, very similar problem. So let's go through this example. So it looks pretty similar. So if I ask you to predict the major product of this reaction, probably what you're going to say is, okay, we just really looked at this. All you've done is add a carbon. So I know overall I'm going to add an H and an OH. Add an OH to the Markovnikov position. So your first guess is probably going to be, all right, that will be my final product here. And that is in fact completely incorrect. The final product actually looks quite different. And here it is. So here's my alkene. My new OH is not attached to either of these sp2 carbons on my alkene. It is in fact attached to this carbon over here. And that is the actual final product. There it is. So that is the major product that is formed in this reaction. So you're probably thinking to yourself, what in the world is going on here? Why is there an alcohol attached to this carbon? And what else is on this carbon? Not shown. There's a hydrogen here. So somehow I'm breaking a carbon-hydrogen bond and making a carbon-oxygen bond. So let's go through and explain what is actually happening here. And the key to this problem is, the key to this problem is that this reaction, when we treat an alkene with acid, is undergoing a rearrangement. So if you notice, the only difference between these two products is there's an extra methyl here. There's some branching going on. And when you have branching next to an alkene, you always have to be aware of rearrangements. So the best way to do this is to go through the mechanism and then show you exactly what is happening. So as I mentioned before, when you have H3O+, it's best for us to write out H+, and to remember that this um, is really a combination of H+, and H2O. So the first step in our mechanism here is exactly the same thing our alkene will attack. Okay, now just as we discussed before, we really have two options. I can add the H to the side that has more H's. That would generate a secondary carbocation, and that's in fact what we do because we're generating the more stable carbocation. Adding the H here would generate a, par a primary carbocation, which is less stable. So again, we're following Mark Harnikoff's rule, adding the H to the side that has more H's because we're generating the more stable carbocation. So let's draw this new structure out. All 
Alright, so this time I'm not going to draw the H in. Remember this position has two H's, and now I've added a new H, so I can just leave this as a methyl connected to one, two, three hydrogens. Alright, this is connected to 1H not shown, 1H not shown, so the key thing we have to do here is remember that now the other side of our carbon is sp2 hybridized. Um, the other sp2 hybridized carbon now has a positive charge associated with it. You know, so I think just so we're all on the same page, let's, I changed my mind, let's add in these H's just in the beginning. So we feel comfortable with that. So I'm going to um, erase this, redraw in that H, draw in my original two H's, recognize that now that is the new carbon-hydrogen bond we just added, and we remember that this is now a carbocation. Okay? So there. The H's that are um, black were originally in the molecule. Here's the new carbon-hydrogen bond we made, generating a secondary carbocation, which is the more stable carbocation, and that's what we form. And this secondary carbocation is more stable than the primary, but this is really the key to the reaction. I'm generating a secondary carbocation. Can I f is there a carbocation that is more stable than a secondary carbocation? Absolutely, and that is a tertiary carbocation. So the key to this problem is looking to the other side of the secondary carbocation and recognizing that we have some branching. Lost that for a second. Recognizing that we have some branching. So what I'm going to do here is draw in NH, and I'm drawing it in red to highlight it and show you that the next step that actually happens is a rearrangement step. All right. So the next step here to really explain why our OH is attacked, attached to this carbon is what happens next. And what happens next is something called a hydride shift. The carbon-hydrogen bond breaks. Carbon-hydrogen bond breaks and it forms a new bond from the, the original carbocation to this hydrogen in red. So let's draw the structure out. Again, this is called a hydride shift. There's my methyl. So this, there's the original hydrogen. We have three hydrogens over here. We'll draw one in blue to remind us where it came from. And now what we've done is added a new carbon-hydrogen bond here. So this is a hydride shift. The two electrons have moved over to form a new bond, and I just put that below. The consequence of that is this carbon had four bonds. Now it only has three. So therefore, that carbon now has a positive charge. This is the key to this reaction, a hydride shift, a rearrangement. Why does it occur? Because this is a secondary, secondary carbocation. When the two electrons in the hydrogen shift over, we've now formed a tertiary carbocation. So our car tertiary carbocation is more stable. So this hydride shift generates goes from a secondary carbocation to a tertiary carbocation, which is more stable. Now, the rest of the reaction is exactly the same, just as we saw above. So if we think about our water, okay, now that we've generated the most stable carbocation that we can, a tertiary carbocation, our water can attack that carbocation, okay, and what happens here, just like we saw before, is let's draw our core structure. 
I'm now going to draw my new bond from my carbon to my O. My oxygen is still connected to the two H's, still has one lone pair, and therefore this oxygen now has a positive charge. Okay, so I'm not including them, but this carbon here has three hydrogens, three hydrogens not shown. This carbon here has now two hydrogens, two hydrogens here not shown, and I don't need to show them because I don't always have to show carbon-hydrogen bonds, but they are there. We have one final step to get to our final product. Okay, and if we remember just like the last step above, we're going to deprotonate that extra hydrogen using a, another equivalent of water. And because we have an extra hydrogen here, my oxygen has a positive charge. To finish our mechanism, we really want to get rid of that extra hydrogen. We do a deprotonation step. I form a new bond from my O to my hydrogen, and I break my hydrogen-oxygen bond. Okay, break the HO bond at the same time, um, leaving me with just an alcohol here. And again, I didn't draw it, but we'll add them in. That alcohol has, of course, two lone pairs instead of one lone pair because the new hydrogen, this bond that's broken, became a second lone pair. And that is our reaction. So really the key thing that we've done here, this is exactly what we saw above, the same um, the, the same mechanism, except there's an extra step, right? And here is our extra step, our rearrangement step. The hydride shift from this CH will shift over. Why that happens is it generates a more stable carbocation. So we protonate, generate a secondary carbocation. The hydride shifts over to generate a tertiary carbocation then the water can act as a nucleophile, attack the carbocation. Another equivalent of water can deprotonate to form our final product, which is shown here. So overall, how do you know that you have rearrangements? You look for an alkene that will generate a secondary carbocation. Look for branching next to it, okay? Now, what we're going to see from your next example, you don't always have to shift over a hydrogen. You can also shift over methyl groups or carbons as well. If there is a hydrogen, that's what you're preferentially going to shift, but that's not always the case. You can shift over other groups as well. Okay, so that is the full reaction and full mechanism. Looking at a rearrangement, something um, very important but difficult to see the first time. So now let's look at the problem I'm going to give you for homework. So looking at this problem here, it looks very similar, but when you look at the adjacent carbon, there are no hydrogens here, okay? So we need to think about, can we shift something over, again, to generate a more stable carbocation? So what, what I want you to do for this problem, which is due on Monday, is provide the final product and provide the full mechanism of its formation.